Rothschild at that Congress in Vienna peace gathering after the Napoleonic Wars. Russia would be on the winning side this time as it was in 1814. Therefore, the Tsar would be securely on his throne. Here it is pertinent to note that Russia, under the Tsarist regime, had been the one country in which the Illuminati had never made any headway, nor had the Rothschilds ever been able to infiltrate their banking interests. Thus, a winning Tsar would be more difficult than ever to cope with. Even if he could be enticed into a so-called League of Nations, it was a foregone conclusion that he would never but never go for a one-world government. So even before the outbreak of World War I, the conspirators had a plan in the making to carry out Nathan Rothschild's vow of 1814 to destroy the Tsar and also murder all possible royal heirs to the throne. And it would have to be done before the close of the war, and the Russian Bolsheviki were to be their instruments in this particular plot. From the turn of the century, the chiefs of the Bolsheviki were Nikolai Lenin, Leon Trotsky, and later Joseph Stalin. Of course, those were not their true family names. Prior to the outbreak of the war, Lenin headquartered in Paris. After the outbreak, Switzerland became his haven. Trotsky's headquarters were on the Lower East Side in New York, largely the habitat of Russian Jewish refugees. Both Lenin and Trotsky were similarly bewhiskered and unkempt. In those days, that was the badge of Bolshevism. Both lived well, yet neither had a regular occupation. Neither had any visible means of support, yet both always had plenty of money. All those mysteries were solved in 1917. Right from the outset of the war, strange and mysterious goings-on were taking place in New York. Night after night, Trotsky darted furtively in and out of Jacob Schiff's palatial mansion. And in the dead of those same nights, there were gatherings of hoodlums of New York's Lower East Side, all of them Russian refugees, at Trotsky's headquarters. And all were going through some mysterious sort of training process. But it was all shrouded in mystery. Nobody talked, although it did leak out that Schiff was financing all of Trotsky's activities. Then suddenly Trotsky vanished. So did approximately 300 of his trained hoodlums. Actually, they were on the high seas in a Schiff chartered ship bound for a rendezvous with Lenin and his gang in Switzerland. And on that ship was $20 million in gold the $20 million ship provided to finance the Bolsheviki takeover of Russia. In anticipation of Trotsky's arrival, Lenin prepared to throw a party in his Switzerland hideaway. Men of the very highest places in the world were to be guests at that party. Among them were the mysterious Colonel Edward Mandel House, Woodrow Wilson's mentor and palsy Walsey, and more important, Schiff's special and confidential messenger. Another of the expectant guests was Warburg of the Warburg banking plan in Germany, who were financing the Kaiser, and whom the Kaiser had rewarded by making him chief of the secret police of Germany. In addition, there were the Rothschilds of London and Paris, also Litvinov, Kaganovich, Stalin, who was then head of a train and bank robbing gang of bandits. He was known as the Jesse James of the Urals. And here I must remind that England and France were then long in war with Germany, and that on February 3, 1917, Wilson had broken off all diplomatic relations with Germany. Therefore, Warburg, Colonel House, the Rothschild, and all those others were enemies. But of course, Switzerland was neutral ground where enemies could meet and be friends especially if they had some scheme in common. That Lenin party was very nearly wrecked by an unforeseen incident. The ship chartered ship on its way to Switzerland was intercepted and taken into custody by a British warship. But ship quickly rushed orders to Wilson to order the British to release the ship intact with the Trotsky hoodlums and the gold. Wilson obeyed. He warned the British that if they refused to release the ship, the United States would not enter the war in April as he had faithfully promised a year earlier. The British heeded the warning, 
Trotsky arrived in Switzerland, and the Lenin party went off as scheduled. But they still faced what ordinarily would have been the insurmountable obstacle of getting the Lenin-Trotsky band of terrorists across the border into Russia. Well, that's where Brother Warburg, chief of the German secret police, came in. He loaded all those thugs into sealed freight cars and made all the necessary arrangements for their secret entry into Russia. The rest is history. The revolution in Russia took place, and all members of the royal Romanov family were murdered. Now, my chief objective is to establish beyond even a remote doubt that communism so-called is an integral part of the Illuminati's great conspiracy for the enslavement of the entire world, that communism so-called is merely their weapon and bogeyman word to terrify the peoples of the whole world, and that the conquest of Russia and the creation of communism was in great part organized by Schiff and the other international bankers right in our own city of New York. A fantastic story? Yes. Some might even refuse to believe it. Well, for the benefit of any doubting Thomas, I will prove it by reminding that just a few years ago, Charlie Knickerbocker, a Hearst newspaper columnist, published an interview with John Schiff, grandson of Jacob, in which young Schiff confirmed the entire story and named the figure old Jacob contributed, $20 million. If anybody still has even a remote doubt that the entire menace of communism was created by the masterminds of the great conspiracy right in our own city of New York, I will cite the following historical fact. All records show that when Lenin and Trotsky engineered the capture of Russia, they operated as heads of the Bolsheviki party. Now, Bolshevism is a purely Russian word. The masterminds realized that Bolshevism could never be sold as an ideology to any but the Russian people. So in April 1918, Jacob Schiff dispatched Colonel House to Moscow with orders to Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin to change the name of their regime to the Communist Party and to adopt the Karl Marx Manifesto as the constitution of the Communist Party. Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin obeyed. And that year of 1918 was when the Communist Party and the menace of communism came into being. All this is confirmed in Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, 5th edition. In short, communism was created by the capitalists. Thus, until November 11, 1918, the entire fiendish plan of the conspirators worked perfectly. All the great nations, including the United States, were war-weary, devastated, mourning their dead. Peace was the great universal desire. Thus, when it was proposed by Wilson to set up a League of Nations to ensure peace, all the great nations with no Russian czar to stand in their way, jumped on that bandwagon without even stopping to read the fine print in that insurance policy. That is all but one, the United States, the very one that Schiff and his co-conspirators least expected would balk. And that was their one fatal mistake in that early plot. You see, when Schiff planted Woodrow Wilson in the White House, the conspirators assumed that they had the United States in the proverbial bag. Wilson had been perfectly built up as a great humanitarian. He supposedly became established as a godman with the American people. There was every reason for the conspirators to have believed that he would easily hornswoggle Congress into buying the League of Nations sight unseen exactly as the Congress of 1945, but there was one man in the Senate in 1918 who saw through that scheme just as the Russian Tsar did in 1814. He was a man of great political stature, almost as great as that of Teddy Roosevelt, and fully as astute. The name of that great and patriotic American was Henry Cabot Lodge, not the phony of today who called himself Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. until he was exposed. Lodge completely unmasked Wilson and kept the United States out of the League of Nations. 
Here it becomes of great interest to know the real reason for the Wilson League of Nations flop. He, Schiff, was busy developing and infiltrating the Stooges to serve in all high places in our Washington government and in the job of acquiring control of our money system and the creation of the 16th Amendment. He also was very busy with the organizing of the plot for the takeover of Russia. In short, he was kept so busy with all those jobs that he completely overlooked the supreme job of acquiring complete control of our mass communications media. That oversight was a direct cause for Wilson's failure to lure the United States into the League of Nations because when Wilson decided to go to the people to overcome the opposition of the large controlled Senate, despite his established but phony reputation as a great humanitarian, he found himself faced by a solidly united people and by a loyal press whose only ideology was Americanism and the American way of life. Thus, Wilson's League of Nations appeals fell on deaf ears. That was the end of Woodrow Wilson, the conspirator's great humanitarian. He quickly abandoned his crusade and returned to Washington, where he shortly died an imbecile brought on by syphilis. And that was the end of the League of Nations as a corridor into one world government. Of course, that debacle was a terrible disappointment to the masterminds of the Illuminati conspiracy. But they were not discouraged. As I have previously stressed, this enemy never quits. They simply decided to reorganize and try from scratch again. By this time, Schiff was very old and slow. He knew it. He knew that the conspiracy needed a new, younger, and more active generalship. So on his orders, Colonel House and Bernard Baruch organized and set up what they called the Council on Foreign Relations the new name under which the Illuminati would continue to function in the United States. The hierarchy, officers and directors of the CFR, is composed principally of descendants of the original Illuminati. The membership of the CFR is approximately 1,000 in number and contains the heads of virtually every industrial empire in America, such as Blau, president of the U.S. Steel Corporation. Rockefeller, king of the oil industry, Henry Ford II, and so on. And, of course, all the international bankers, also the heads of the tax-free foundations, our officers and or active CFR members. In short, all the men who provide the money and the influence to elect the CFR chosen presidents of the United States, congressmen, senators, and who decide the appointments of our various secretaries of state, of the treasury, of every important federal agency, are members of the CFR, and very obedient members indeed. Now, just to cement that fact, I will mention the names of a few of the United States presidents who were members of the CFR. Franklin Roosevelt, Herbert Hoover, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Jack Kennedy, Others who were considered for the presidency are Thomas E. Dewey, Adlai Stevenson, Nixon, and vice president of a CFR subsidiary, Barry Goldwater. Among the important cabinet members of the various administrations, we have John Forster Dulles, Alan Dulles, Cordell Hull, John J. McCloy, Morgenthau, Clarence Dillon, Rusk, McNamara, and just to emphasize the red color of the CFR, we have as members such men as Alger Hiss, Ralph Bunch, Pazwolski, Harry Dexter White, real name White, Owen Lattimore, Philip Jeffy, etc., etc. Simultaneously, they were flooding thousands of homosexuals and other blackmailable characters into all the federal agencies from the White House down. Remember Johnson's great friend Jenkins and Bobby Baker? Now, there were many jobs the new CFR had to accomplish. They required much help. So their first job was to set up various subsidiaries to whom they assigned special objectives. I can't name all the subsidiaries in this recording, but the following are a few. The Foreign Policy Association, FPA, 
the World Affairs Council instruments in this particular plot. From the turn of the century, the chiefs of the Bolsheviki were Nikolai Lenin, Leon Trotsky, and later Joseph Stalin. Of course, those were not their true family names. Prior to the outbreak of the war, Lenin headquartered in Paris. After the outbreak, Switzerland became his haven. Trotsky's headquarters were on the Lower East Side in New York, largely the habitat of Russian Jewish refugees. Both Lenin and Trotsky were similarly bewhiskered and unkempt. In those days, that was the badge of Bolshevism. Both lived well, yet neither had a regular occupation. Child at that Congress in Vienna peace gathering after the Napoleonic Wars. Russia would be on the winning side this time, as it was in 1814. Therefore, the Tsar would be securely on his throne. Here it is pertinent to note that Russia, under the Tsarist regime, had been the one country in which the Illuminati had never made any headway, nor had the Rothschilds ever been able to infiltrate their banking interests. Thus, a winning Tsar would be more difficult than ever to cope with. Even if he could be enticed into a so-called League of Nations, it was a foregone conclusion that he would never but never go for a one-world government. So even before the outbreak of World War I, the conspirators had a plan in the making to carry out Nathan Rothschild's vow of 1814 to destroy the Tsar and also murder all possible royal heirs to the throne. And it would have to be done before the close of the war and the Russian Bolsheviki were to be their instruments.